It's a great pleasure to be with you here today in Wichita. Let me just give you a bit of information here on, uh, on my background. Um, the, um, uh, as as uh, James indicated, I was a three-term member of the L.A. County Transportation Commission. I'll give you a little bit more on that uh, as we go on. This is a picture of L.A. Um, um, if you ever land in Los Angeles, they give you a marvelous opportunity to... Um, uh, let me see here. Oh, here we are. To, to take a wonderful picture of the city on those days you can see it. And you can see it a lot more now than you could before. Uh, I'm also co-author of the Demography International Housing Affordability Survey, which has, is routinely quoted in the world press. We do 360 cities a year. Uh, 90, 85 of them are major metropolitan areas, and we've had a, a real impact uh, including major, uh, leading to major land use changes in New Zealand where they've somewhat followed some of our recommendations. Um, having trouble here. Uh, I also do something called Demographia World Urban Areas, which is the only annually published estimate of urban populations in all urban areas more than 500,000. Um, and it includes, in addition to that, land areas and population densities. Because since there's so much interest uh, on, on population densities, and we have a lot of fun with that, we get about a million downloads a year on that as well. Um, I am a blogger, more, most recently at Huffington Post, but have been for five years at New Geography, uh, where I do, among other things, a series called The Evolving Urban Form, which has now covered uh, all um, uh, mega cities in the world except for two, and they're the only two I haven't been to. Uh, so let's talk about the whole context, and my real passion is cities, and transportation is sort of a secondary issue, and obviously cities depend upon transportation. I would argue that the purpose, and so we're going to talk, we're going to start very quickly talking just a little bit about cities. Cities exist because of aspiration. People move to cities to have better lives. The picture here of Shanghai, which really uh, typifies this. Um, if you look at world history, and I was just reading, somehow I just got my hands on a book that's only been available for about 35 years, The Third Wave by Alan, uh, Alvin Toffler, who basically uh, really does a nice job of giving sort of a, of a popular overview of history and, and essentially, if you look at history before 1800s and even to this day, the default position on economics in the world is poverty. Poverty has been what we have been faced with throughout all of human existence. This is uh, shanty towns along um, a waterway in, um, in Manila. Now, here's what's happened to cities. You know, we think we, cities are now a part of our lives. More than half of the people in the world live in cities. More than 80% of Americans live in cities. Why is that? Well, look at the fact that the largest cities in the world barely ever exceeded one million people until about 1800 when Beijing became a million, but it fell back after a while, and London became a million and has since gone up. Now the largest city in the world, Tokyo, is about 35 million people. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how the Industrial Revolution changed things radically and how um, uh, incomes went up. You can see the relationship, and this isn't the only important thing, but you can see the relationship uh, between the changing of the, of, of the dominant mode of transport. You can see that until about 1820, when everybody had to walk, and don't think that everybody had horses, only the rich had horses, um, you had GDP per capita, this is in $2,000, very low. 2,000, 3,000 was the very top in places like the Netherlands. Then during the 1820s up till about, depending on what country you're talking about, the early 20th century, transit came to the fore, became somewhat dominant, though there was still an awful lot of walking. You can see a huge increase in, in, um, uh, in GDP per capita. And then with the coming of the car, it's just exploded. At the same time, uh, that obviously we still have very important transit systems around the world. Uh, one of the interesting issues with respect to urban, um, the urban form is population density. Uh, the world's poorest megacity and the world's most dense megacity is Dhaka in Bangladesh. 114,000 people per square, uh, per square uh, kilometer. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, per square mile. 
Um, that compares to Wichita at 2,200. In other words, you multiply Wichita's population density by 50 and you get DACA. Um, LA, believe it or not, is the most dense urban area in the country because it has very dense suburbs, doesn't have much of a dense core, but when you go out to, these, uh, to the exurbs of New York, you find that the densities are very low. Um, here is a picture of a slum. I was a shanty town I was privileged to visit in, in, in Dhaka and Bangladesh. The population densities in Dhaka shanty towns get so high that the entire population of the Wichita metropolitan area could be housed within 140 yards of this place. In other words, just a little bit more of a radius than the extent of a uh, football field. So again, we in America are very fortunate. A, a lot of people are concerned about urban sprawl, and that's fine. Um, and there is this usual damning of America for urban sprawl. But take a look at Addis Ababa, which is a third world city in one of the poorest countries in the world, Ethiopia. In 1972, the red is what the city covered in terms of land area, far more dense than today. Today's density is at least a half below what it was in 1972. And in 2010, look how far it's gone. So what a lot of people don't realize who spend their lives complaining about sprawl is that sprawl is absolutely universal. universal. The only place that you cannot find sprawl is Singapore. Because you know what? Singapore has filled up the island, and you have international boundaries that prevent the development of suburbs on the outside. Now, we have seen great progress, especially since World War II. This is a picture of Levittown in New York, uh, where the Levitts managed to put together 750 square foot houses that GIs moved into as they left overcrowded Brooklyn and Queens. And we've seen the housing, uh, the, the, the um, uh, home ownership in this country go from about 40% to 70% a real uh, democratization of prosperity that those of us who didn't live at that time or weren't aware of what was going on at that time, and believe it or not, I'm not old enough to be aware of what was going on at that time, uh, the change in the affluence of America has been absolutely stunning. But by the way, if you've ever been to Paris, I'll bet you didn't see this. A lot of people don't realize that the city of Paris, for example, has lost more population than the city of Chicago and that the suburbs are about four times as large as the city of Paris. So again, Paris is absolutely surrounded by suburbs, which are unbelievable. Or you can go to Tokyo, uh, new housing uh, for sale in the outer suburbs of Tokyo. You go inside a model house, and they've got paper walls and all that kind of thing. But in many ways, they're really duplicates uh, with respect uh, of, of what we see in the United States. We are really lucky. This is a chart from Brookings, the Brookings Institution, that basically ranks uh, metropolitan areas of the world by their gross domestic product per capita. This is 2012 data. Believe it or not, Hartford, Connecticut ranks number one. Probably not surprisingly, San Jose with Silicon Valley two, Washington with the government three, and so on. But look down the line here. Uh, where is it? I'm not sure what rank it is, but look at Des Moines. Uh, Steve uh, Spade and I were talking about this before the meeting, where he's spent many years as the general manager of the transit system. Des Moines, Iowa, mind you, ranked in the top 15 in terms of affluence in the world. And Des Moines, Iowa, in many ways, looks very similar uh, to Wichita. So again, uh, American cities have done very well, and you'll notice and, we, and I think this is 25. I forgot to count. One, two, three, four, five. Five of the 25 cities are outside the United States. 20 are in the United States. That's as of 2012. Now, there's good uh, research that basically says we, we all have the a sense, I think, that larger cities tend to be more affluent. And that generally is true. And there's in, incredible research. And by cities, I mean metropolitan areas. I'm not talking about the city of, Metro, of, of Wichita. I'm talking about the five-county metropolitan area. Um, essentially, researchers at the Santa Fe Institute have basically found that as cities double in size, they tend to improve their economic productivity by something like 15%. Now, I've done a bit of work. Uh, this is a city sector model, work that I've put together, 
looking at cities at the small area level as opposed to central city versus suburbs. And one of the reasons that's important is you think about, again, Hartford, Connecticut, little place of about 15 square miles, I think it is, maybe 10 square miles, hasn't changed its boundaries uh, in living memory, and of course has lost population. And it's all urban, heavily urban. Go to Phoenix, I, I challenge you to find anything that's urban in Phoenix. And so <laughs> what we, I'm, I'm serious, there is, I mean, San Jose, San Jose had 95,000 people in 1950. Uh, Phoenix had 113,000 people in 1950. We're not talking, Phoenix was smaller than Wichita. Now, here we are. Here, what we did is we said, let's look at things at the zip code level and look at characteristics that really imply the kind of urbanization we had before the great automobile oriented expansion of suburbanization after the war. There was suburbanization before the war, but uh, before the war, things were much more dense. A lot fewer people took, uh, drove to work by car and so on. So we've divided cities around the country, the top 52 metropolitan areas, into four classifications. And you see that despite a lot of what's talked about about this so-called return of the city, which is so-called, uh, but I won't go ahead, get into that, uh, that actually the urban cores continue to decline in population. Even the inner cities are declining, and the population growth continues into the outer suburbs. That is not to, uh, to, to deny for a moment, however, the incredible progress that has been made in the central cities and the cores over the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, you can't find a, a, a single one of our 52 metropolitan areas of more than a million that hasn't experienced that kind of a, a resurgence. However, what we found is while there is a resurgence going on in the core, Outside that immediate core area, still in urban core areas, the population losses have more than, um, have, have more than uh, compensated for the gains. Now, in Wichita, uh, uh, we did a special analysis in Wichita since, since it's all automated and I can do it. Notice, actually, the urban core, not very big, obviously, improved a little bit relative to the population in Wichita. But you see the same thing going on in the out. The inner suburbs declining in terms of the percentage of population. The outer suburbs, and this would be within the built-up area, uh, improving, increasing. And unlike a lot of places, the exurbs actually declining. For the most part, they have been improving. Now let me give you one big compliment, Wichita, and that is housing affordability. Do you realize if you are a medium income household in this city, and you in this metropolitan area, and if you uh, buy the median priced house and pay 10% down, you are going to be better off than your colleagues in San Francisco who make $36,000 average uh, based upon median income more than you do. It's unbelievable. Um, and so, uh, and again, one of the reasons that this is so is because you, like many cities around the country, continue to have fairly liberal land use policies that do not force up the price of housing which is what's happened in California over the last 40 years, where 40 years ago, California house prices were relative to incomes, essentially the same as they are everywhere else. So now let's move and talk about uh, highways. Uh, this is a picture of what uh, Torontons like to talk about as the widest freeway in the world. Actually, the Pan American in um, um, uh, highway in Buenos Aires, and there's another one in in Bangkok are a little bit wider, but here it's 14 lanes, uh, it gets to 16 lanes. Uh, that's just to sort of make sure you're all aware that even America doesn't have the widest freeways in the world. This democratization of prosperity I talked about uh, really is not only a matter of housing that is affordable, but it is also a matter of transportation that allows us to get throughout these huge metropolitan areas that have developed uh, in the country. Um, Remy Prudholm and others at the University of Paris, uh, David Hartgen at University of North Carolina, Charlotte, have done work that basically shows that as you increase the number of jobs that can be reached in a metropolitan area uh, by the average worker, you increase the productivity of the city. Very important research. Uh, beyond that, um, the, uh, there's good research out of the University of California that indicates that access to cars is crucial for helping low-income people get to work, and a very strong work out of the Progressive Policy Institute uh, and the Brookings Institution that recommends that one of the best things you can do for low-income people 
is try to find ways to get them cars. And the reason for that is very simple, and we'll talk about in a minute, and that's transit and its focus on downtown. Downtown is really the only place you can reliably get a lot of people to ride transit. If they're going to jobs that aren't downtown, chances are they are going to have to transfer and may not work because the work trip is, is so long. And here's how bad it can get, you know. What, what you, just to give you an idea, I want to talk a little bit about congestion. This is Hong Kong, Nathan Road. Now, actually, Nathan Road today doesn't look like that because half of it is blocked by protesters. But <laughs> the fact is, it's still congested even today. Now, a lot of people think that we have terrible traffic congestion in the United States. And, that, and, and yeah, we do. There's no question that L.A. is not a nice place to drive. But if you look at the international data that is now beginning to come out from GPS organizations, what you find is that traffic congestion in the United States is about as good as it gets. If you look, for example, at Europe, uh, on average in, in European metropolitan areas of more than a million um, work trips, I, I should say uh, uh, peak period travel is about 18% more longer than it would be without the congestion in the United States, the average is only 6%. So we do very well on traffic congestion. Now, Wichita uh, does well as well. The, the data in the United States, unfortunately, Wichita is not indicated in the international data. Uh, the Texas A&M Transportation Institute uh, rates traffic congestion in 101 cities throughout the United States. In 1982, you were ranked 72nd, not bad, not bad. And in, 19, in 2011, you were, you were ranked 93rd. So while you may think of traffic congestion as being a problem here, um, 92 cities in front of you don't think of it that way. Uh, here is a list of, that just has come out from TomTom, Tom, uh, who is a GPS company. They've now begun to rate Chinese cities for the first time, and the congestion in China is terrible. Uh, this, again, is percentage of time during peak hour added to travel by traffic congestion. You notice the worst is Moscow, uh, then the Chinese cities, there are a bunch of them. But the interesting thing is out of this top 10, there's one that is missing, Los Angeles. Los Angeles is in a 20th tie with Paris. So again, as bad as it gets in the United States, we do relatively well. Uh, here's a, a, another indication of how well we do in the, country, in, in the United States. If you look at work trip travel times, East Asia, these being essentially, and the data is limited there, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, Osaka, 42 minutes each way is the average travel time in East Asia to work. Australia, which if you go there, you could mix it up with America, 35 minutes. Why? Australia never built freeways to speak of. The freeway systems are dreadful there. Canada, uh, surprisingly bad. And look at the U.S. down there, better than anyone at 25 minutes, one way. And look at Wichita. Again, you have it really great. And I hope your Chamber of Commerce is hyping this when they go around the country trying to encourage businesses to come here. Your work trip travel time is 18.8 minutes. That's almost seven minutes below the national average and a, a real competitive advantage. So let's talk a little bit about transit. And I always like to start out transit with Tokyo. Tokyo's transit system is so big that it all by itself carries more riders than all of the transit ridership in the United States. It is unbelievable. Tokyo, 60% of all travel in Tokyo is on transit. So it is a much different situation. In the United States, as I'll, and this is the Yamanote line at Tokyo Central Station, uh, here is a route map. Now, I don't know if you can figure that out. I've never been. This is a route map that purports to show all of the commuter rail does not include, by the way, the two subway line, uh, two subway systems in Tokyo, completely separate. The Yokohama subway, the the, um, uh, the the monorail in Chiba, and so on. Okay, now one of the interesting things, though, is transit is often thought of, and rightly so, as being incredibly important to low-income people. But in the United States, this um, this uh, blue or uh, green line basically shows you the percentage of people using cars, whether carpool or driving alone, to get to work. You notice that people who make under $15,000, believe it or not, largely get to work by car. 
It's very simple. Uh, they'd, go to, they'd, they'd take transit if they could do it, but, but they don't. So that's, again, very important, and it makes the point, again, that I'm concerned about with respect to uh, the polycentricity, the spreading of jobs around the metropolitan area makes transit not very effective for most of the trips. So that, for example, nationally in the United States, and it's not a fair comparison because we, have a, you know, we don't even have a city as large as Tokyo, but nationally in the United States, among urban areas, 2% of travel, less than 2% of travel is by transit, and, uh, and this is service travel, 98% is by um, car, SUV, and so on. That compares to 60%, say, in Tokyo, uh, almost 90% in Hong Kong, and about 50%, 60% in Osaka. Now, transit ridership in the United States is very concentrated. 55, 54% of transit commuting, now I'm talking about people work, going to work, 54% of the transit commuting destinations in the United States are in the six what I call transit legacy cities. And I mean cities, not metropolitan areas. They are the city of New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, San Francisco, and Washington. 55%. Those six cities have only 6% of the jobs. So they've got essentially 10 times their share. Um, their suburbs. Uh, you know, you think about New York, for example. The city of New York has 8 million people. The New York metropolitan area has 20 million people. So there are more people outside the city than inside the city. Yet you see that the legacy city suburbs have only 10% of the transit commuting um, uh, destinations. Now, mind you, this is, is, is work trip destination, not residential location. Fortunately, the new American Community Survey provides all sorts of data we didn't have before. Other major metropolitan areas, over a million, have about 26%, and then outside, and you would be in that elsewhere area, about 10%. So the basic point is transit is really concentrated nationally, and, and mind you, uh, all of those six legacies have huge downtown areas. They also, they all, they also have the six largest uh, downtown areas uh, in the country, not least being New York with the second largest business district in the world outside Tokyo. Now the Brookings Institution has done some work that also indicates some of the difficulties of getting around on transit. Um, the, the dark line indicates, and this is from a 2008 study, the dark line indicates the percentage of people in metropolitan areas that are within walking distance of a transit stop, not too bad. I mean, you got LA, believe it or not, LA, that's incredible. Over 90% are within walking distance of a transit stop. The, the lighter uh, part of the bar, though, indicates the percentage of people, the percentage of jobs uh, that can be reached in 45 minutes. And so you can see that if you're dependent upon transit, the number of jobs you can get to is, is really pretty small. So in my view, I'm always put off by metropolitan planning organizations and other planning organizations that basically try to, re try to indicate the effectiveness of transit based upon how many people can walk to the transit line. It's not important at all. The importance is once you get to the transit stop, where can you get on it? And this indicates it's a problem. There's more recent research that I didn't have the time to chart out of David Levinson's uh, work at University of Minnesota just announced within the last couple of weeks, and the numbers are really dreadful there. Uh, they're basically suggesting that something less than 2%, looking at the biggest metropolitan area, less than 2% of the jobs are available to the average worker in a period of 30 minutes. Now, 30 minutes is important because the average travel time in the United States is, um, is only 25. Uh, national work trip market share, I call it work access because we also count working at home. Uh, national, you see 5.2% are on transit. Um, the car and carpool dominant. Now, carpool is going down, uh, and the day is going to come in the next couple of decades, I'm sure, that carpool will be below transit because actually transit's done pretty well in the last couple of decades. I think it was in, um, I think in 1990, it, it managed to come in only at 5%. So it's gone up a bit. It's holding its own, but it's not going up a, a, a bunch. What's really changing is working at home, uh, which at current rates could trans pass transit. Uh, any time in the next decade or maybe a little bit longer. Now, the situation, however, is considerably different in Wichita, and this is metropolitan area of Wichita, not the city of Wichita, uh, which, though, isn't that much different. Transit carries 0.4% of the commuters, 
Uh, work at home is also a lot uh, smaller. Interesting thing is that Portland, which a lot of people consider a real model for urban planning, uh, for some years now, at least four or five years, working at home has uh, accounted for more commuters than transit. Um, and um, one has to step back and, and recognize how much money they spent on transit and how much money they spent on uh, working at home. They spent none. Um, and in fact, in Portland, transit market share is below its 1980 level before they started work on the transit system. But let me tell you about my personal experience where I indeed, on the spur of the moment, without any indication of support from my appointing authority, the mayor, introduced a, mem uh, a motion in a 1980 meeting to basically take some of the money we were getting ready to put on a ballot initiative to go to the voters um, uh, and, and, and dedicate it for rail. Because I had become, as a result of my citizen activity, convinced that in, uh, we, we could reduce traffic congestion in LA uh, with, with urban rail. And of course, the consultants were all right there to say, oh yeah, amen, it's how, what's, what's going to happen? Well, in 1980, and now by the way, we now in LA have, you can't believe it, five light rail, well, I've got it there, two subway lines, five light rail lines, five commuter rail lines, and two busways, all built since, 19, well, all but one of the busways, built since 1980. In 1980, the share of travel by transit to work was 7%. In 2012, 7%. So again, if anyone, obviously, I'm somewhat critical of urban rail, uh, and it's not, again, that the technology is wrong. Look at how much it does in Tokyo. The problem is that the land use is wrong, and anybody that thinks you're going to redo Los Angeles or any place else or Wichita or anything in the, in, in the image of Tokyo it doesn't understand economics. So let's spend, I'll just finish up with a few thoughts on, on the environment. I love taking pictures, as you can see, and occasionally an airplane goes over southern Greenland, which gives me an opportunity to make a nice environmental slide here. Um, a lot of people don't realize the extent to which pollution has improved in the United States. This chart basically shows uh, here that total emissions since 1980 are down 62%. This is total in the United States. This is not per capita. It is total. Driving, where are we driving? Yeah, driving was up 95%. Now, has that happened? Well, all these regulations and uh, other technological improvements Pollution is far better today than it was a long time ago, and, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Another thing to think about, and this is why congestion is so important, and this data is from the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. The red line indicates greenhouse gas emissions and their increase as congestion increases. And notice it actually goes up pretty much lockstep uh, with delay hours, maybe a little more. And a lot of the discussion that talks about trying to get people out of their cars and into transit misses the point that higher density areas are routinely, uh, routinely face greater traffic congestion and thus increases in greenhouse gas emissions. And we have not seen good research on that, but it is not impossible that in some cases you may very well not get the intended improvements because of this relationship. Finally, this being LA, my hometown, um, this is just, just shows you what happens to emissions uh, as a result of speed. As you, as you speed up cars, generally, emissions uh, get better. reason I like this picture is, seriously, many of us, we're not aware of those mountains in the background there. Um, seriously, you can't believe how bad it was uh, before, say, 1980. It was dreadful. And seriously, you couldn't see those mountains most of the time. Now. Every time I go back to LA, you can see those mountains. And so uh, it's, been, it's been very, very successful, and things are a lot better in LA as they tend to be elsewhere. That doesn't mean they're perfect, but they're better. Here's the other thing that a lot of people don't recognize, but this is data right out of the US Department of Energy. We're, you realize the Obama administration has gone through two rounds of improving vehicle emission standards. Most recent will move us to uh, a, a new car standard of about almost 55 miles per gallon by 2025, okay? Now that only applies to 2025, so what we have here is right out of the U.S. Department of Energy Annual Energy Outlook Report, the gross G greenhouse gas emissions from cars, gross, not per capita, gross, is projected to be reduced by more than 20% by 2040. 
as a result of those regulations. And if you have improvements after that, because this is only, this is only the government regulation side, uh, you're liable to see technological advances as well. If the same, uh, if the same rate were to continue, you're going to go th be 35% be by 2040, but that is speculative. Most planners I talk about are completely unaware of this data, which they can find in five minutes on the internet. And this is official U.S. Department of Energy projections on greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the next 25 years. So ended up with just a cute little slide I picked up one time when I was in suburban <laughs> Paris. Uh, and it shows you, and you know, planning's not e easy. You know, I, I've heard some people who say we're in designing new university campuses, they don't put in sidewalks, they wait till the, the paths get created. But, but that's what, the, what, what planners are faced with, trying to figure out what people, they're trying to make sure that their planners, uh, that their plans are consistent with uh, uh, with, with what the people's uh, uh, preferences and desires are. Otherwise, you can get into all sorts of waste and so on. But, but anyway, that's it. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions.